The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the QA TV staff or board of directors. QA TV, in compliance with FCC regulations, is prohibited from exercising control over the content of independent, member produced public access programming. Welcome to the annual meeting of the Princess Valley of Tide Mill. It's been a while since we've held one of these meetings, since before the pandemic and uh, certainly before I joined. But uh, we're delighted to see everyone here and hope you continue your participation with the Frenzy of Tide Mill. Uh, first on our agenda, which I'm going to try to go through quickly so that our speaker, uh, can, Earl Taylor, can present his, uh, give his presentation. Uh, so I'd like to go through the list of the board members so that everybody is aware of who they are and uh, and other people who are associated with the Friends of the Saturday Tide Mill. Uh, first of all, my name is Beverly Anderson. I am currently the president of the FSTM and glad to be here. We also have here, if you could stand up, possible Kathy Hogan, who is our secretary. Bernios, who is our treasurer. Doug Homerl, who has been a long-time participant of the FSDM and one of its authors. Carolyn Marks. Carolyn Perry. Yeah. Carolyn Perry. Been with the Friends of the South of Tide Mill for many years and has contributed to it greatly. Um, Frank Hogan. Yeah. Hey, Tetzel, there was my next one. <laughs> so please stand, Tetzel. <laughs> two or three years ago. And it is a genuine uh, relative of the um, previous owner of the actual owner of the tide mill, the Southern Tide Mill. So we're glad to have him. And if you could stand too, Ted, we'd like to acknowledge some other people that you may be related to, one of whom is Southern Barnes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, John. John Sauder. Ed Sauder right here, and Susan Sauder. This is my lovely one. You're most of Okay, so with that, I just wanted to go forward with the um, other elements of the meeting to, to move through those so that we can hear the presentation. Um, I wanted to go quickly through the uh, some updates on what the Friends of the Sound of Tide Mill have been up to and what we've accomplished over the past you know, three to five years. Uh, the pandemic gave us a chance to do a lot of planning because there wasn't a lot we could do. We could not have a lot of interaction with the public, although we did try to have some meetings down at the mill. Um, but again, it gave us time. And as the pandemic wound down, we started to get into action. One of the things we were able to accomplish was get the Tide Mill listed as one of the historic sites in Quincy in anticipation of the Quincy 400 celebration in 2025. And uh, we've been accepted into that. So it's now one of the heritage sites of the city and we're going to, the friends are going to focus some of our efforts on planning for that major event. Uh, the second thing was clean and greener Quincy. We have a very, very energetic crew uh, that, including me, <laughs> that goes down to the mill every time that event is, is carried out. It's one in which the city of Quincy supports basically the cleanup of various sites around town, including picking up trash, doing gardening, etc. And so we've been very successful with all of that. We've had a lot of volunteers trying to join us um, when we carried out that work. Uh, we recently found out that we were getting funding from the city of Quincy. It was actually in the um, Patriot Ledger, um, 95000 to address needed repairs to the mill. And as I understand it, it's the back framing area of the, of the mill that they'll be working on. But it's much needed, and we were very glad to see the city supporting uh, improvements to the mill. Um, archaeological assessment of the mill site, Bob Davin, who is the city's director for historic and heritage resources and the Quincy Department of Natural Resources. I had to read that because it's a long one. Uh, Bob Damon has been supportive of the mill. We've had several meetings with him. 
And what he carried out, we haven't seen all of it yet, but they carried out with, I think it was ground penetrating radar or something. He did, they did an analysis of what could be under and around the mill. And um, they've also done some planning to map out the structure of the mill itself. And that would serve as a record of at least what was there should anything happen to the site so that we had some sense of what was going on as well as were there, was there, I don't want to use the word buried treasure, but if there were artifacts of any kind under the ground there um, that we might, you know, that they might want to protect or be aware of. Okay. And then, okay. Signage. Uh, Kathy Hogan. Kathy, where are you? Right here. Please stand up. Kathy uh, worked very hard on an application to the Mass, Cult Mass Cultural Council or at Quincy Cultural Council, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, to get funding for us to do, to put some signage out in front of the mill. What I mean signage, just something almost like that trifold out there, but certainly more stable um, that can last a long time. And explain what the mill was and what it means to all of us and how it reflects on Quincy's history. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be matching the 2,500 that we received from the Cultural Council uh, with our own funds from the FSTM, so about a $5,000 project in front of us. But we anticipate this first attempt at conveying, you know, in a permanent, um, a permanent sign um, what the tide mill meant in terms of Quincy history and all the different aspects of it, um, but and it will probably be a small, but it will small side and <laughs> pieces signed, but um, it will be a first step towards us, you know, developing information on the tide mill and conveying it to the public. And then again with Bob Damon, um, towards that end and towards uh, in light of our website, which has gone through several iterations, but we're not really happy with what we've got right now, it's okay. Uh, but we want a more active website, and one that really conveys the different aspects of the Tide Mill. So between that and the signage, we really wanted to get a group together, and I'm saying this because any one of you could be invited to this discussion when we hold it. Um, is to parse out what we really want to say about the mill and how we want to say it. Um, and how are we going to attract the most people to this particular site and help them learn about the site. And that again will be um, Bob Damon is going to help us. He's trained in helping organizations develop messaging and, and things like that. And so he will be in charge of the meeting when we hold it. So if you would like to attend that, please let us know. Uh, we would really appreciate everybody's input. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we could discuss in that meeting would be things like focus on the technology of the time. How did a time mill work? That's a very, very um, popular kind of idea to focus on. The other one was the importance of the links to both, not only the Salvage family, but the Adams, the Adams family, to John Adams and his family, which is a very important aspect of this site. And then um, the issue that's very interesting to me is the Quincy Canal and the granite being conveyed down with the Quincy Canal onto the stone sloops, the ships that were made, as I understand it, at the Southern Tide Mill. Um, all these different aspects of it from a historical standpoint can be very interesting, but we want to find out how to best convey that and find out who wants to, frankly, really grab people. That's sort of the marketing aspect of it, but we want people to learn about this Tide Mill. So with that, I think, does everybody have any questions on our activities or any suggestions? No? Okay. So, um, we go on to Friends of the Sound and Time Mill Business, and that would be Steve Curtis. Well, is this the time when you want to say you want them to say it? I'm sorry? What was your last thing? Did you ask if people want have anything to say? It was now yes. time to say yes. it. Oh, yes. Just like for... Quincy 400, I was looking for somebody that might be able to put together or help me to do a bread baking um, demonstration either at the Tide Mill or at um, Kilroy Square <coughs> because during the COVID the biggest explosion of people staying home and doing was baking bread and this was a Tide Mill so anybody has any interest or can guide me in a way of doing a bread baking competition 400 at the Tide Mill or Kilroy Square. I'd appreciate the help. 
or any information they can give me. Hi everyone, my name is Steve Cardios. I'm the treasurer for the Francis Sutton Tide Hill. And um, I got a real short presentation. Um, I'm just gonna um, take one second and um, sort of touch base on, on one thing that uh, Beverly was saying. Um, you know, we, we, we definitely want some more volunteers. We definitely need some more help on the board. Um, uh, we're, we're, our, years ago, I, I, I joined the board years and years ago and now, and we, we used to have meetings of 10, 12, 13 people, right, Carolyn? So I uh, went down to about six, or six of us, five or six of us now. And so we really could use your help if you find the meeting today. Um, interesting at all, and you want to join us, it's a, it's a great group. We get together once a month and, and try to move uh, the issues about the middle along. So um, we'd love to get some help from you. So, um, and and I, I just passed out to everybody a little, uh, little, a little sheet here. Um, Treasurer's annual report of the Southern Tide Mill. So, um, as Beverly had mentioned, we haven't had a meeting in, and we haven't had an annual meeting in quite some time. So this isn't really an annual report. It's kind of like 16 months or so, you know, it's a bit more, and it's not that I've lost track of time or anything like that. It's just we haven't had a meeting. So um, it didn't really make sense to, um, to go back to our last meeting, which might have been like three years ago at this point. So um, I went back to December of, of, of 2021. Seemed like a natural place to kind of pick when you look at the expenses and uh, funds coming in. Right after that, we had a fundraiser in October. Actually, right before that, we had a fundraiser. As the money came in, uh, we raised about uh, 1900 about $1,900. And then we had, since then, we've had a little bit of uh, dues and donations straggling in. So we've brought in about $2,100 in the last 16 months or so, and we've spent about uh, about $1,100. You can see there's some um, just some general expenses in that list to run an organization, right? And general expenses at the bottom there, the $524, that's like printing and postage and um, envelopes and things like that. Just the basic stuff that keeps a, a, an organization moving along. So um, we're sitting with about $8,800 in our in our checking account, uh, we have about two thousand dollars earmarked for um, helping for our website, and that's really it. Uh, our, our charter, our, our Francis Upton Town Mill Charter, requires that we have an annual meeting uh, once a year, and in that meeting, we give a, an annual report on the expenses. So um, that's about it. Any questions related to finances of the mill and our friends group? Pre in a pre in a pre-COVID age. We were tracking uh, membership and saying, okay, here's our membership because these are the people that donated, right? But but we, it wasn't like if you didn't donate for you, we didn't send you a, a notice or something. I mean, our membership is larger than the people who have donated on an annual basis. Um, we probably have 250 people in our database that we mail to. Um, there's probably 40 of those that addresses that we need to fix. So there's probably a solid 200 people to, 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 in the 2 to 230 range. Uh, membership, you know, and so um, I, I think that's probably accurate. That, that was your yeah. you know, questions getting at me. Okay. Anything else, anyone? Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Beverly, who will uh, introduce our guest speaker. Thanks. Uh, not quite oh, yet. Quite, no, sorry, not sorry. Yeah, I'm jumping the gun. Sorry. Okay. Jumping the gun. All right, so right now we have our elections. Oh, now, right. the way I, yeah. I yeah. understand this works, having read it, Kathy, but in, if I'm saying it incorrectly, is that we all, those of us that hold the position, the treasurer, the secretary, the president, etc., um, hold those roles for one year, and then they have to be reelected. And that's the way our, our bylaws stay. Um, you can also work, if you were in a position, you can also stay there for three years, but after three years, you cannot stay for a fourth year until, I think it's 45% of the voting membership uh, votes for you. So, uh, right now we are going to be looking at the uh, people who hold the roles of president and secretary and treasurer. Um, so my first question is, I know I would, I would like to stay in the role of president, but there may be someone else here that would like to take that on as well. Kathy, do you want to stay, do you plan to run for secretary again? Yes, I do. Okay. And Steve, do you plan to run for treasurer? Yes. So there are your three candidates and anyone else who wants to participate, very please stand up and, and let us know because we'd be glad to have you. Are we electing board members back on too or just, just the offices? Uh, so, I think it's just so, the officers. I don't know okay. that. Because we've got a lot of board members, we're going to have to. Let's ask Car Carolyn about how do we do that, Carolyn? Yeah, you like the board. The whole, the whole the board. Whole board. Yeah. All right, so it'd be Doug and. They, they are usually on the three year term when they come on. 
Yeah, well, it's, we haven't had an election in three years, so um, <laughs> everybody's up for grabs right now. <laughs> well, I, I know, but must say, object to that the current board member remain for another three years. <laughs> Does anyone a second? Okay. Is anybody recording this? Yes. Okay. Right there. All right. <laughs> um, okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay. So all the board members are on. Uh, I was worried about that one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the board members don't necessarily include the like officers, that. obviously. Yes. It's because you paid okay. So for secretary, we have running Kathy Delay Hogan. Are there any other people interested in running for that position? No. Okay. All in favor of reappointing Kathy and Delay Hogan to the role of secretary? Oh. Huzzah! <laughs> What's that? Okay. Okay. For our um, financial officers, Impertius, treasurer. Excuse me. I think Doug, did Doug get out of here? Doug? I was just clearing my throat. I was just clearing my Doug was saying you wanted it because you were clearing my throat. It's taking okay. mission. Yeah. Are you still interested in yeah, serving? Yeah. Okay, Steve. Anybody else wants to be treasurer? Okay, that said, all in favor of Steve Perdios being reappointed to be treasurer? I say aye. Aye. That wasn't a very hard yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. eye. Okay, yeah. fair. Yes. Does somebody want a second? I'll second it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Steve is still the treasurer. Gotcha. Gotcha. And gotcha. somebody else should do this for me, but is there anyone here here who wants to be president of the Friends of the South or Tide Mill? No, I hope that we uh so I think Beverly is the president of this all the time. Second. 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 Okay, now we have another moment where we'd like to uh, recognize a long-term member or two of the Friends of the Southern Time Mill. And I'm going to invite uh, members who would like to speak along with me to the reason we are providing an award today. Uh, to speak about why we chose them. We are giving you this Friend of the Year Award to both of you who have contributed so much, so much and for so long to the Southern Tide Mill. You saw the family here and this makes, makes it magic. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine this time though, like John Salter, he was the founder of it, and there's a family sitting here while they do it. That's, that's magic for me. I absolutely love it. And I mean, but like, I love Quincy, look at the history. I'd like just to tell people we're on the town river, and halfway down the town river, on the German town side, German town side <coughs> there's a shipyard at the same time as the South was started called Phillips Shipyard. And they built the largest sailing ship in America at the time, it's called the Massachusetts. They built the Massachusetts, and then when the War of Independence came, the US didn't have a navy. So they quickly formed one in the shipyard. And John Salvo was supposed to be one of the captains at the time. So they formed the Navy, but they needed a boat. So they came to the town river, they took the plans and they took the workmen from the town river. They went to Charlestown Navy Yard and they built the Constitution. So the birthplace of the Constitution is right by the time of the year on the town river. Later on, what year was it? The 1797 that they built the Massachusetts. Yes, what year we redo it? We, 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 do it. we, we, we celebrate it, you mean? Yeah. Um, 19, 19, 19. Well, in, in the 19th, 89. What, 1989. 1989, what we did, we went down to the Charlestown Navy Yard and we got the copy of the Constitution, the plans of the Constitution and the Massachusetts and they lent us some of their carpenters. We came back to Quincy just over the road from where it was built and we took the kids from the school and the housing and we built a 37-foot replica of the Massachusetts. We reversed it completely, put it in the Christmas parade, and we got first prize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take that in the of the town river 
being the birthplace of the Constitution, yeah. I'd just like to get it out there. It was the uh, specialty category. Specialty category. Yeah. So anyways, um, we're asked to read this. Uh, Friend of the Year Award from Friends of South Italian Mill, presented to Kathy and Frank Hogan for their tireless efforts and outstanding dedication to the preservation of Quincy's historic South Italian Mill. This annual awards honorees possess a civic-minded spirit that inspires us all, presented on June 6, 2023, from the Friends of South of Tide Mill. Thank you. Thanks. And the secretary. And the secretary, I want to be sure that everybody signs the signing sheet. <laughs> well, I think it's time now to hear from our guest speaker, um, Earl Taylor, with the Tide Mill, uh, Tide Mill Institute, which is president and the Dorchester Historical Society. Thank you for inviting me to give a presentation to the friends of the Souther Tide Mill. Um, the content will be a reminder to most of you because you've all heard this before. So uh, sit back and feel comfortable. You don't have to learn anything new. But it's important to keep fresh in our minds the, the value of this piece of our cultural heritage, of your cultural heritage more than mine. Uh, it's a focal point from which you can jump, jump off in many directions. You can tell the agricultural history of Quincy. You can tell the uh, commercial history. You can tell industrial history and maritime history among the topics. So our home slide this evening is a drawing of the Southern Tide Mill and the lumber mill as well behind it by Joe Chetwind, who many of you may have known when he drew this illustration. And uh, the site accommodated various commercial activities over hundreds of years. And the story of the mill that operated there on tidal power is central to the history of the tale. So in 1802, Ebenezer Thayer, a merchant in Boston and Charlestown, soon to live in Quincy, uh, purchased about 39 acres of land uh, between the road to the ferry and the town river. And on the river, he built two wharves, a grist mill and a lumber mill. In 1806, the Massachusetts legislature passed an act authorizing Ebenezer Thayer to build a dam across town river for the purpose of erecting a mill or mills on the same. And that he carried out this purpose is evidenced by the mention of the mill pond when he sold the property in 1814 to, to David Stetson of Charlestown. But Stetson only owned it for a year, and he sold it to John Souther, who then carried on uh, several industrial activities. The shipyard, a wharf, a grist mill, a sawmill, and the canal walk. Ebenezer Thayer's grist mill was a major agricultural landmark in the early community because it'll allowed local farmers to grind a variety of grain into uh, meal and bran. And the building we saw a moment ago in the illustration was the second mill building. The first burned in the 1840s. And so uh, what we have all come to know and love is, is a, a new mill built in the 1840s after the fire. <clears throat> Luckily, portions of the, um, the mill remained, the uh, first floor framing, some recycled charred timbers, and the mill dam are all uh, still there. <laughs> and uh, the new structure is what's above that. Now, this is a photograph, studio photograph, of four generations of the Souther family. So the man on the right is John Souther. Uh, next to him is his son, uh, John Lincoln Souther and then his grandson on the left, and his great-grandson in the middle. Uh, John Souther was born at Hingham, in Hingham in 1781 and received his education at Derby Academy. After leaving school, he became an apprentice in his father's shipbuilding business. And on becoming of age in 1807, he became a partner in that business. In 1815, he came to Quincy, uh, bought the, the mill property, and established business for himself. 
And he was a careful businessman and well-respected, as we can see from the fact that he was elected one of the uh, selectmen and assessors for nine years, representative to the legislature for five years, school committee for two years, and various prominent committees around the town for other activities. On retiring, he moved to Boston, and he died there in 1878 at the age of 90. Now I'm going to move into sort of the history of Tide Mills, and you can see that Tide Mills began around uh, the beginning of the Common Era, 2,000 years ago, and moved onward through time. And in the middle, I don't know if the pointer will work, let's see here, yeah. So we come through England, well, Ireland first, France and Ireland, and then through England, and then um, up here to the New World, Annapolis, Canada, in 1607. Well, all of those um, immigrants from England and Europe who came to North America beginning, you know, 1620, and after that into the Great Migration, they brought the technology with them. They had learned it in their own towns in uh, England, where there are many, were many tide mills, and uh, they brought that technology with them. So we've been mapping at the Tide Mill Institute the sites that we know were tide mills, and this is what we know in Europe right now. And then, of course, in America, we know a lot more just because our records are here. And so we've, we've mapped those. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. And if you zero in on the map on our website, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more mill sites. But what is a tide mill? So essentially, a tide mill is a water mill, but it derives its power from an impounded uh, reservoir of water. And that impound is at least partially fed by seawater. So there's salt water in that pond, and that's because of the rise of the tides. So a, a river mill or a stream mill depends on the drop off in the land for the wastewater to run away. So they could position their, their wheel wherever they liked because that water was going to fall away. With a, a tide mill, what we have for difference in elevation is the difference between high and low tides. So the range of the tide is all we have to work with. And so if you had a mill wheel like the one we just saw, where the water was coming into the top, then you pretty well use up your available water uh, very quickly because uh, uh, it, it has to be that high. So um, you can power that mill wheel from the bottom by putting a, a sluice way toward the bottom to mill wheel, or you can use a horizontal wheel, and we'll see examples of those. So here's a, a slide. Um, the ocean is off to the right, upper right. The tide pond is the lower left, and the dam in the middle. And right now we're at low tide, so it's equal in both sides. Well, it may be just a rising tide. You see a little bit of water coming in at the bottom right through that um, sea hatch, or tide gate sometimes it's called. And then at high tide, of course, it's equal outside and inside the dam because it's been filled and that sea hatch is now dropped down because there's no more pressure from the tide coming in pushing it up. So it holds the water in as the tide goes down. And here we see the tide on the outside has gone down but we still have that impound of water in the tide pond that we can use and send through uh, the mill to power that wheel. And you can see that that is going, that water is going to hit the bottom of that wheel as opposed to the top. Another set of illustrations, essentially the same thing, but you can see here the rising tide is the same on both sides. The gate, that orange gate in the middle is open, so it allows the, the water to flow in as the tide rises. And then when the tide is full, that gate is closed and the tide outside the mill pond starts to recede. And then they open when the tide has gone all the way out, or nearly all the way out, they open a little chute 
to allow water to go through to hit that horizontal wheel that you see at the bottom of this illustration. So this is not one of those vertical wheels that we're all familiar with on the outside of dams that go like this. This one goes horizontally and the water hits veins in it and pushes it around. And you can see the shaft from that wheel. This is a direct action up to the millstones. The millstone on the top is the one that's connected to the shaft. The one on the bottom called the bedstone doesn't move. It, it's just there's a hole in it for the shaft to go up to reach the, the upper millstone. Well, a tide mill requires a dam. So what do we have here in Quincy? We had a dam across that opening. The tide gates would have been pretty much right there, then they would have looked like barn doors. But you can see more, this is where the dam was. And again, a little of the dam on the left side of that photograph. But dams require gates as well. So what do we have? We have barn door gates. This is the kind that were used at the Souther Tide Mill. And as the, the water flows, um, the, the mill pond in this illustration is on the far side. So as the water flows from our side from the ocean in, it keeps those gates open. But when the tide goes down, those gates will automatically close as the water from the pond starts to push them, to, uh, come out and push them too. So again, this is where those gates would have been. Other gates are flap gates. We saw those in the, the picture with the sea hatches. Um, we have a lift gate, so this was actually mechanically operated, not using the water power to do it. And wheels, well, different kinds of wheels. So the overshot wheel at the upper left is the one that would be more common on the mill stream where, uh, where it's a stream or a river. And on the, the right as well, this is a pitch back, it's just that the wheel is going backwards where the, the trough goes out over the wheel and then the, the water is dropped in and it, it just rotates backwards. Uh, breast wheels, those come in at the side, either at the top, the middle, or toward the bottom. But the undershot wheel is the one that, that was used with tide mills because the water is directed right at the bottom of that wheel and it gives you all the space from the high tide down to that lower level to, to work in. And then the horizontal wheel, the original, here we have a stone wheel, uh, but the, you can see the water hitting those veins in the wheel and turning that wheel around to rotate the shaft. And here's another illustration of that. At the bottom, you can see the wooden chute, the penstock it's called, uh, directing water at those veins in the horizontal wheel. And here is another illustration. The light colored green is the mill pond and the sluiceway, the penstock that leads down to the bottom of the horizontal wheel. And you can see again that this is a direct action. The, the shaft comes up from the wheel connects to the upper millstone, and, and um, that's the one that turns. The bottom millstone just stays stationary. Eventually, they put that horizontal wheel into a tub, which made it somewhat more efficient. And event, again, eventually, that led to the uh, invention of the turbine, because it was the next logical step. And this is a remnant underneath the Souther Tide Mill of a tub wheel, a uh, tub, you know, the, the tub for the wheel. And uh, presumably they've seen that in their ground penetrating radar. Here's a millstone that has that, the notches in it for the shaft to connect into. So this is an upper millstone. Uh, and millstones have furrows that are chiseled into them, uh, a pattern on the bottom wheel on the bottom stone and a pattern on the upper stone. And the, the furrow pattern depended on the kind of grain you were grinding. So whatever you ground most is how you dressed your millstone with furrows. And uh, it's, a, it's the action of the two together that, that grinds the grain. And it, the, the uh, flour falls into those grooves and then moves out uh, to the perimeter. So you can see them here, you can see that upper millstone is connected. Uh, 
to the shaft and the shaft just goes through the bottom millstone. The hopper up above for the grain and then uh, it's let into the, the interior of the stones and then it gets ground and then the flower migrates out. And there's always, um, you need a structure to keep that flower from going everywhere. So at the back of this illustration, you'll see the, the wooden cover for the millstones. And in the middle, of course, you see the upper millstone has been taken up by a crane so that you can work on the stones, either sharpening the furrows or whatever else you might need to do. And that in the bottom there, you see the arm from the shaft that will connect into the holes in the upper millstone. And of course, power can be transferred from a horizontal shaft to a vertical shaft and in different directions with gears and uh, pulleys and things. So in the, the sort of purple illustration, you see the, the gear the, at the top of the shaft, and then that power is transferred with an, a gear in another direction to, to move something horizontally as opposed to vertically. And for lumber sawing, which is another thing that ha occurred at the Souther site, you needed a different uh, kind of horizontal tool. And this one uh, rotated so that the saw would go up and down. And you have the saw frame that's connected to the bar. So it goes up and down and, and creates boards out of your uh, trees. So this map is from 1858. The red circle shows the Souther Tide Mill. And so we'll go back to the story of the Souther Tide Mill. So the business um, included the management of the lock for the canal. The uh, John Souther deeded to the Quincy and Canal Corporation free passage through his dam. Souther was to have full use of the tide mill pond for his mills in order, and then the, uh, the lock operation was to be kept in order by the mill, by the canal corporation. But no more than six inches of water could be used from the lock, for the lock purposes. So that that way there was enough water for Souther to continue to use his mill. Apparently that was adequate and they existed comfortably together. So the, um, the locks were required for the transportation of granite uh, from the uh, Quarry Street area um, out to the ocean. And uh, it went through the Quincy Canal. He did a good business at the grist mill among his other commercial activities. And um, he bought out his junior partner, Micah Humphreys, and also owned a, uh, the old stand uh, Souther Grain Store in the middle of Quincy. And the Souther Shipyard did a great business, launching schooners, brigs, and, and stone sloops, and an occasional full-rigged ship. And the saw mill, of course, cut the logs into lumber. But in 1846, a fire happened, and it was caused by an unknown incendiary, so perhaps the town drunk or someone setting the fire by mistake. And uh, the dam, as I think I mentioned, the stone wharves, the first floor framing, and some of the first floor planking remained. And charred evidence of the fire still exists on the underside of the mill where the old floorboards were flipped over. And so uh, the charred pieces on the bottom now. Um, the grist mill was replaced right away, but the lumber mill was not replaced for another 30 years. Hen Henry's younger brother, Edward B. Souther, who if you could see this close up, you would see his name on the, um, that location in 1858, uh, took over the operation of the grist mill. Um, Souther's nephew, John Josiah Adams Fenno visited the mill and uh, uh, just a year later and recorded his observations. So some of the corn was brought by schooners. I remember one lying at the mill full to the hatches and the corn being hosted up to a window in the gable. 
There were probably other cargoes, but most of it came by rail, was carried to the mill and ground. Then as meal was taken back to the store. The mill was a clean, sweet place. The floor and stairs smoothed and polished like a dance floor. The rumble of the stones, the jar of the mill, the smell of the meal, and over it all a fine dust covered everything inside the building. It all comes back through the years. On the second floor were the bins full of corn, two sets of millstones, each at the top of a vertical shaft, which was at the bottom of the mill. And uh, there was a horizontal wheel in each of them, and a, a flume which directed the water uh, from a gate in the bottom of the dam into that uh, horizontal wheel. Many small mills, like the Souther Mill, were put out of business by new technology, and that was that new technology developed in the northwestern part of the country and into Canada with their great wheat growing uh, capacity. And so a lot of the, the mills in the east being small and without a regular big supply any longer of wheat uh, couldn't compete with those larger operations. So around 1875, Joseph Loud and company became a tenant in the grist mill and Loud owned a feed store and operation in, uh, at, near the Quincy Railroad Depot. And so I think the Southers probably felt that Loud had, had the advantage because he was right next to the railroad, and so they figured better make some money off a tenant than uh, go out of business entirely. Uh, yes? Um, it was Coddington Street and I think Coddington and Washington, if that's an intersection. <laughs> Sometime after 1877, but before 1888, John Souther Sr. erected the new sawmill uh, on the site of the old sawmill. And um, the one that had been lost to fire in the 1840s. And the new mill was still run by tidal power. And the building did survive until the 2007 fire when the lumber mill portion of the site was destroyed. Uh, it was last used, I think, as the, lum as the planing mill for the, the Quincy Lumber Company. And the Souther Tide Mill site was sold to Benjamin Johnson in 1888, and it's likely that the original machinery of the tide mill was taken out at that time to accommodate uh, lumber storage. So Johnson operated and expanded the sawmill and the lumber yard uh, business over the next several decades. Right, we can see that this is an illustration of the site uh, from around 1879 and then a close up or more close view of that same illustration. Um, and if you could see this again, you'd see the, the name of Benjamin Johnson there at the site. <clears throat> and these are some of the more recent views, the late 70s into the 90s. And uh, you can see there the lumber mill that was beside the current tide mill building. Uh, there's another view of it. Uh, it gets more and more decrepit every time we move along. Um, and there it was, the, the lumber mill was still there. And these obviously before 2007. Um, again, kind of uh, in its doldrums. And then this is a photo when Carolyn Marks was this came in the newspaper and Carolyn's photo was there as well. She was hyping the, the need to restore <laughs> and uh, luckily things happened. And now just I want to compare this. You see the windows on the side of the mill that they've been taken out now. So it would be interesting to know that whether windows were original or whether they came in with the lumber storage because it would be nice to put the windows back if they were from the period of the, the grist mill. 
And as a, a building, it takes its place among a, only a few tide mill buildings that are recognizable as tide mills. Several buildings have been turned into residential housing. But on the top left, we have the, the one in Virginia, the bottom left, one in Long Island, Huntington, Long Island, and of course, on the right, the Souther Mill. So that's pretty much it for tide mill buildings that look like what they were. Most often, all of the sites that we know of have maybe a dam like this one that's been breached, maybe some sticks in the mud. So thank you for listening to me. I just uh, think it's important for us to all acknowledge every so often the, the value of our cultural heritage and, and what this site can mean to all of us and to everyone in Quincy. So thank you for listening. Thanks. Yes. Um, when the two millstones are together, do they both move or this one? Just the top move? one. Just the top one. And yep. The other one is stationary. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Happy to answer. We're happy to try. What the, what's the weight of one of those stones and how did they get them into place? And it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I think they're quite heavy. I mean, I'm guessing like a thousand pounds. And. Um, they needed a lot of heft, <laughs> you know. I'm sure they used, um, you know, what do you call them? Uh, not levers, but you know, what, what is, block and, block and tackle there, that's what I'm looking for. They're um, usually made out of like, um, granite? Or? Usually granite, so of course here in Quincy, probably granite, but um, there's a, something called a French burr yeah. millstone that uh, was very popular around the world, so it, it's possible that they imported the material for the stones, or perhaps even the stones themselves. But they would have probably cut the furrows here at least, even if they had imported the stones. Good. So then Benzel had to, after the fire, and get something to be built for them. And they put in the first class. They expanded the study of the operation. That's when they added the second primary study. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I think um, environmental laws and, uh, you know, which are well-intentioned and good laws would prevent us from trying to generate energy in that way. It's the impoundment of the water that's really objectionable. And there are new technologies that we can use that are being tested uh, to avoid having to impound water. So there are uh, machines that sit on the bed of the ocean and the blades move like windmills but under the ocean and it's from the currents in, in underneath. You can also put them near the, the surface and as the tide rises and falls it, it'll, and they work backwards and forwards so it's a more efficient operation. Some of them float in the water with a tether um, to a, a generation station so that they can, you know, the, the, the motion and, and they, some of them go like kites in a sort of parabola kind of um, uh, motion so that uh, they generate um, electricity that way. And, and recently we've heard of other kinds of um, electricity generation just from the humidity in the air. There was a Boston Globe article about a week or two weeks ago how um, one of the local universities has found a way to generate just from a grid as the humidity, you know, I don't know what size those holes are in that grid, but they figured out that they could actually generate from the humidity in the air. So it seems like an endless resource that, that we just need to develop 
and it'll be much better than impounding water, which prevents, you know, fish from moving upstream and, and all sorts of other problems with um, stagnant ponds that, that become foul smelling and so on. So the period of time between high tide and low tide that the movement of operation that they could write was like coming pushing the grain, but they well, I don't know the answer, uh, but some did keep records, and so it can be found, with, at least for a few mills. The, one of the interesting points about it, though, is, of course, the miller has to follow the tides. And sometimes you'd have to pull an all-nighter because, you know, <laughs> the tide is full at different times every day. And so your, the miller's schedule changes every day by what, in the, what are the tides on it. Lunar schedule, which is 24 hours and 50 minutes, so you've got that adjustment every day and twice a day. You know? So the tide is full in the day and it's full in the night or in the evening and in the morning. So it, it, it requires someone to um, have a variable sleep schedule. You know? yeah. uh, the very first picture, uh, you know the names of the three gentlemen in the picture? I do. Do you mean uh, for the three gentlemen and the child, right? <laughs> All right, so John Souther, Henry Souther, Henry, um, then Henry Phipps Souther, Henry Phipps, my great grandfather's name was Harrison Phipps. So there's connection there. And then the, the grand, great grandchild was Harrison Abbott Souther. Harrison Abbott. So um, we were lucky at the Dorchester Historical Society because we have a, you know, a property that was once owned by the family that the Souther, someone in your family donated that photograph to the Dorchester Historical Society, well, donated to the Museum, Museum of Fine Arts. They decided they didn't really want it, and so uh, they suggested the Dorchester Historical Society. The family said yes, and so we ended up with the photo. <laughs> so we're lucky. Yes. Is there any sites in the U.S. Uh, in my life a couple of years ago, we were traveling in Europe, and we went to the middle of England called the Pennines, and there the great rocks, the granite uh, mountains. We came on two towns where they made millstones. And they, they, uh, they cut them right out of the rock. You see the whole thing. Is there any mountains in the U.S. where we can, we can go see that? I don't know of any. I mean, I know that the millstones were quarried here, but I don't know of a location where you can see any evidence of it now. So what was the period of time uh, that the mill was active? From 1806, we think. But definitely by 18, um, what was it, when, when Thayer sold it, what was it, 1813? Um, and then uh, to about 1880. <laughs> But the Quincy Canal must have been a tidal canal also, I would imagine. Yes, but um, I'm sure it was partly tidal, but there must have been another source, a, a river, a stream coming into that canal uh, reservoir as well. Well, it's, it's pretty much paved over now, but you know, if you go across the street from the tide mill building and the building across the street and its parking lot are kind of over a portion of the, the canal and behind that, you know, the, the, I don't know if there's any water there now, but it, it, it's a big open spot. Uh, yeah, it's under goodwill. Under Is it goodwill? Yeah. It Right, it goes it, the it, it all the way to Braintree. No, yeah. It goes, it goes past the, um, it goes past the, um, the Home Depot at, at the Adams Street Home Depot. Wow, yeah, okay. Actually, the whole New England coast 
Were there any tide mills? Uh, you know, I think of the tide coming in. Okay, but having been a sailor in Mass Bay, the tide at Hull Gut runs fast both ways. You know, when the tide's coming in, it just, and then when the tide turns, it doesn't take long before it's flowing. Have you ever seen a, a mill built in an area like that where they could utilize the speed of the water? I've heard of it, but, you know I mean? yeah. yeah, but, and you need a um, mechanism that allows it, the yeah. wheel to go in both directions and to connect to the, you know, its shaft in, in both directions. And so the, there have been some, but uh, I don't know of any in New England. Well, I know that the tide in Powell Cut is pretty strong. Well, the average swimmer is not going to swim across. Well, yeah, I think that could also be a, a problem um, that it's so strong that it, it might be difficult no. to build something there that, that could withstand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey. Well, I uh, grew up in Manchester, Massachusetts, and we. Um, we were sort of closer to the Gloucester line, and there was a lot next to us where a brook ran through. And there were two, basically, humps of land on either side. Um, and we just used to call them the two hills or the two islands or something. We used to play on them. And the brook ran down all the way down into Black, uh, Black Beach and, the, and the, the bay down there. Um, so I never knew anything about it more than that, and just recently I was at a friend's house in Hull and he had a very old map from the 1950s that literally mapped out the area. And it showed uh, that, that, that raised land, it said tide mill on it. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, and so we, I never knew that, that was there. Um, but how could I find out more about that? Well, one of the things you could do is to look at the TMI website and go to the portal, that the location map, and zero in on Manchester. Yeah. I know that there was a tide mill there that we know of. Now, whether it's the one <laughs> that you're... I think there was a, one, I think, at the other side of town. But this one was right, um, you know, in a re basically a residential area. Well, uh, it would be very interesting to research, and um, I'd love to see a copy of that piece of the map. Or I think you should recognize Bob Damon here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Would you like to say anything with regards to the times? I can just update you all on um, work that the city of Quincy is doing related to the preservation of the mill and the property around the mill. Uh, folks who are in the uh, Friends Society have been some of the meetings. I have heard from this from this from me before. Um, we are going to by this fall. We will have finished. Um, and he had a full level of current preservation level documentation of the mill building and all of the mill property um, around the mill. Um, so that will include uh, what's known as state level documentation of the building itself. So that's a documentation of the current existing conditions of Southern Tide Mill building. Um, and we will also be doing, we're doing a um, historic structures report or structures assessment related to the building as well. Um, which talks about its current composition, that much of the building which is original versus reconstructed, all of those kinds of good things. So we have a full picture from a preservation point of view of the building in its current state. Um, we are also finishing surveys of the granite walls um, built that were part of the evidence of Bayer's original wharves. Um, now a single wharf on a town river that was done by Mr. Johnson, uh, as you heard, if we were the lumber yard, he would join the two uh, various separate wharves, and between the wharves were a launch area for the Souther's uh, boat uh, production operations. Mr. Johnson would come in and make that an entire flat wall so that large lumber sloops could come in and unload their lumber on that area on the wall. Um, so we're doing the first survey of those walls. It's been done, we believe, since the walls were built, roughly probably around the time of the Quincy Canal. Um, and we have finished a reconnaissance survey of the property. Um, and we will be doing what's called the photogrammetric survey of the entire property. Um, so if you don't know what that is, that uses LiDAR technology, your 3D digital technology. Um, it's done using drones. Um, and when you're finished, it just takes them a couple of hours to actually fly the drones all around the property. When we are finished, we will also have a full 3D di uh, digital rendering 
of the tie bill and the site as it currently exists, um, all for preservation purposes. Um, once that's done, we will be actually announcing next, this coming fall, uh, a number of really important master planning processes related to both the Southern Tide Mill building um, and the Southern Tide Mill property uh, as the city moves forward with its preservation work related to um, the entire site. So just a quick update for you on, on where we are in terms of making progress with regard to the preservation work related to the building. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Very much enjoyed this evening the meeting and the chance to share with you what we've accomplished over the past several years. Yeah, thank you.